Howdy. The purpose of this video is to introduce the basic symmetry elements that we need to describe uh, point group symmetry. Uh, and so there are four of these. We're going to talk about uh, mirror planes or planes of symmetry. We're going to talk about inversion points. We're going to talk about uh, proper rotation uh, axes. So let's say we have a twofold as an example, a twofold rotation axis. Uh, and we're going to talk about improper uh, rotation axes or roto inversion. So one example might be uh, threefold roto inversion. Um, and we're going to try and give examples of objects over here and see what they look like on uh, stereographic projections. So we're going to talk, start talking about uh, reflection planes. And an example of an object is this two-handled mug we have here. I actually have two of them. Uh, and we'll see the handles aren't uh, in a line. They're at a bit of a bent angle to each other. But that's fine. Um, because you can, you can pretty clearly see that if we have a plane that passes through the center here, if I take some point on the left side of that plane, I can reflect it through the plane. And I essentially have an equivalent point over here. Um, you know, as with all symmetry operations, um, the existence of a mirror plane means that I can reflect this point or feature across that mirror plane and the object remains unchanged. Um, so in a stereographic projection, uh, I would um, have a mirror plane coming down like this. We can have the center uh, illustrated here. Uh, and it's useful to think about what this mirror plane does to some general object. And so how we illustrate that here is maybe we have an object that is slightly above the plane of the stereographic projection. And this mirror plane will reflect it from one side over to the other. And it'll still be above the plane. Um, but you'll notice if I take something like a hand and I reflect it across, uh, I don't get the same kind of a hand anymore. Now my thumb has switched to the other side. And so we talk about this going from uh, being a left-handed to a right-handed object. And how we denote that in the stereographic projection is by having a little comma inside of our general object every time it's been reflected or inverted. So that's one example. Uh, but we could also consider what would happen uh, if I had something that was shaped like this mug, but it was uh, sealed on both the top and the bottom. And in that case, I would have a second mirror plane that passes horizontally through the object. Now, because it's passing horizontally on the stereographic projection, I'm going to illustrate that um, as a line that passes all the way around this horizontal equator. And so now we can ask the same thing. What happens to this general object that's sitting slightly above the plane? Uh, and we remember this is a horizontal mirror plane, so it's being reflected down below where the object is currently sitting. Um, so we oftentimes, uh, that's not so good. We oftentimes have the circle and it is split in half. And that allows me to show that when I've reflected it down below, again, it's gone from right-handed to left-handed. So the minus means it's below the surface of the plane and the plus, plus means it's slightly above the surface of the plane. So the next symmetry element that we're gonna consider is the inversion point. And like it na its name suggests, this is a point in space. And so in a point group, it has to be located at the exact uh, center of our point group. Uh, and so one good example of something like this is the ethane molecule. So if we picture a point in the very center, um, every atom out here can be inverted through that central point and out the other side to a point here. And so another way of thinking that, of that is that an original uh, position, x, y, z, uh, goes to negative x, negative y, negative z. And just like uh, with reflection planes, inversion points change the handedness of an object. So let's try a general point up here. It's sitting slightly above the plane. Uh, when it gets inverted, it goes through the center, uh, the inversion center, and it comes out the other side. And so now it's going to be slightly below the plane, and it will have changed from being right-handed to being left-handed. So next we're going to talk about proper rotation axes. And one example uh, would be the Great Period of Giza. And this is a 
square pyramid, so the base of the pyramid uh, is a square. We can't see this other line uh, coming behind it here, uh, but this is a square pyramid. And what that means is that there is a rotation axis that passes directly through uh, the center of this pyramid, and I can rotate it uh, 90 degrees, and it will um, look exactly as if I had not uh, rotated it at all. I can do that another 90 degrees, another 90 degrees. So this is what we call a fourfold rotation axis, C sub four. Um, and the four means that uh, you're able to rotate it 360 over uh, N degrees each rotation, where in this case, uh, I have a fourfold. So 360 over four equals 90 degrees each rotation. And so again, with symmetry elements, you know, the, the point is that when I operate on it with this uh, symmetry element, when I rotate the pyramid uh, fourfold, so when I rotate it 90 degrees, it will come to rest and it will look invariant. It will look as if it has not uh, been um, changed at all. So this is a good example uh, where we can talk about the difference between a symmetry element and that's this fourfold rotation axis and the symmetry operation um, because uh, each time I rotate it, that is an operation and I can rotate it clockwise, I could rotate it counterclockwise um, and these are all different operations. So let's, let's come over here to our stereographic projection uh, and let's think about if I have a general object and uh, again, let's put a fourfold rotation axis here and so I draw that uh, basically just as a square. Um, if I'm showing the axis, the square is sitting at the end of a long axis like this. So uh, I could rotate it once, and again, it's still gonna be above the plane of the sphere, and I have not reflected it or inverted it, so it has not changed from right-handed to left-handed. Uh, I would rotate it again, so we're over here, rotate it again, and then one ro more rotation and I come back to the original position. And so I could call this particular operation, if this is my starting point, let's start here, going from one to two, uh, I could call this a C sub four one. So I'm rotating it uh, once counterclockwise. Um, going from one to three, all the way out here, I would call this C sub four two, because basically I have now uh, rotated two sets of 90 degrees. And you'll see that C sub four two is identical to a C sub two, a two-fold rotation. Um, I could also go one, two, point four, and I would call this C sub four three. Um, and this is basically the difference between rotating counterclockwise and rotating clockwise. Uh, and I could come all the way back, so I've rotated all the way around, and this would be called C sub four, four, but in this case, um, I've rotated out around a full 360 degrees, um, and so that is the same as essentially not changing uh, the pattern at all, and we, we call this E, the identity operation. So the thing to be aware of with proper rotation axes is that um, in point groups, we are not limited um, by, uh, by the value of n in this equation. So I could have c1, c3, c7, c97. And there's no intrinsic limit on uh, the number of rotations um, per 360 degrees, or the number of steps per 360 degrees uh, in a point group. One perfect example of that is if I have a cylindrically symmetrical object. So for example, a wine bottle here. And if I think about rotating it through an axis um, through the center of that bottle, um, essentially I could rotate it any small arbitrary angle of rotation uh, and the item uh, remains invariant. And so I would call this a C sub infinity uh, proper rotation axis. Uh, and that's for cylindrical objects. Now we'll talk later uh, when we introduce translational symmetry, so when we're talking about crystals, um, this is not the case. I can only have uh, C1, C2, C3, C4, and C6. So those are the only um, 
five allowed proper rotation axes uh, in a object that also has translational symmetry, so a three-dimensional uh, crystal lattice, for example. So we're going to conclude by talking about roto-inversion. And here, let's think about if I have a tetrahedron and it's sort of sitting on its edge like this. I could pass a rotation axis through the center uh, of this object, um, but it's no longer a proper rotation. Um, well, okay, I will take that back. We do have a two-fold rotation axis through here, uh, but there's something a little bit more. And so if we think about this point here, and we consider rotating it 90 degrees, and then inverting it through the center, we end, uh, we end down on the other corner of the tetrahedron. And I can do that again. I can rotate 90 degrees, invert through that center inversion point, and I'll end up up here. And a final time, rotating 90 degrees and passing through the inversion point, I will hit the final corner of the tetrahedron. And so really this is a combination of a fourfold axis uh, as well as an inversion point. Uh, but because it's the combination, we don't uh, designate it by the C sub 4. Usually we use uh, S sub 4. And so this is a designation for an improper rotation. And so again, it's a combination of rotating 360 over n degrees and then inverting through that central inversion point. So let's see what that would look like on our, uh, on our stereographic uh, representation here. We're going to start um, at some general point, and again, this is going to be a fourfold roto inversion or improper rotation axis. I'm going to start at some general point slightly above. I'll rotate 90 degrees and it will invert through the center, and so I'll end up down here below uh, the surface of the plane, and because I have inverted, I'm changing from right to left hands. I will again rotate 90 degrees and invert through the center. And so I'm ending up over here. So once again, I'm above the plane and I'm right-handed. I will do this one final time. And I end up uh, down here. So I am again below the plane and I've switched from right to left-handed. Now, uh, there are a couple things that we need to be aware of. So if I have a... Uh, S sub 1, um, that is a 360 divided by 1 rotation, so I rotate 360 degrees, but then I'm combining it with an inversion point, this is the same as a just a simple inversion point. Um, I could also think about uh, S sub 2. Now I'm rotating it 180 degrees and inverting through the point, and if you think about it a little bit, uh, S sub 2 is identical to introducing a mirror plane uh, that in this case would be orthogonal to that uh, improper rotation axis. Um, so these are basically repeats of things we've seen before. However, S sub 3, we designate that a triangle with a dot in the middle of it. Uh, S sub 4, this is designated by a square uh, with a sort of uh, ellipsoid, so that's that two-fold rotation symbol inside of it, uh, or uh, S sub 6. Um, and so that would look like a hexagon with a triangle inside of it. So these are the improper rotation axes. Um, so basically those four elements are all you need to know to be able to understand and to uh, describe different point groups. Uh, point groups are basically all about how do they combine uh, together and interact with each other.